Psalm 65, it's a psalm to the choir master, a psalm of David, a song. Certainly the word of God. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness. O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. If this incredible creation, I'll ask the praise team, go ahead and come on up. If this incredible creation can, can respond to what God has done by, at least metaphorically, breaking out in songs of joy, well, we ought to be able to pull it off this morning too. So let's join the praise team.
for the opportunity to be in your house. Dear Lord, we just lift up your name this morning. Dear Lord, we call you majesty, we call you king of kings. Dear Lord, one of many titles that you are given, you deserve. Dear Lord, we pray that you'll just prepare our hearts to, pr to hear your message this morning. Be with the pastor as he preaches your word. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. morning we're continuing to consider what it means to give thanks in all things. And I want to start off our time together by telling you the story of Roger Holland. Roger was a tailor apprentice in London living a sinful life in bad company. Uh, one day after gambling away some of his master's money, he planned to escape on a ship to France or Flanders. And, but before he went, he reached out to another servant in his master's house, a young lady named Elizabeth. He told her about his gambling losses, and he said, well, I want to I write an IOU to my master that you'll give to him that will explain, I will earn this money, and I will pay him back. But instead, Elizabeth, who was a Christian, dug into her savings. She had a small inheritance, and she dug into that inheritance, and she gave him the money. She gave him the money he would need to cover his losses and said, I will hold your IOU. 
as long as you promise to change your ways, go to church with me, swap your Roman Catholic prayer book for a Bible, read that Bible, and pray every day that God would show you the truth and forgive you of your sins. If you'll do that, I'll hold your IOU. You can have the money. Within six months of doing that, Roger was saved. And he led others to faith in Christ, including his father. And his father was just so taken by, by the gospel and the change in his son that he set his son up in his own business in London. And Roger eventually was able to pay back Elizabeth. And they kind of fell for each other, so they ended up getting married. Roger and Elizabeth. But sadly, that was the year that Queen Mary took the throne of England, converted the nation back to a Catholic nation, and began to persecute the churches. In June of 1558, Roger was worshiping with some 40 people in an illegal worship service in a field in London, and 27 of them were arrested. 22 of them were sent to Newgate Prison, a horrible place if you know anything about history. And they were there about seven weeks. Before they were locked up, they were told all they needed to do to gain their freedom was to sit through and participate in a Catholic Mass under a priest. Their consciences wouldn't let them do that, though. So they stayed in prison, and as a result, 13 of them were burned at the stake and died. One of them was Roger Holland. During her five-year reign, Mary had over 300 dissenters burned at the stake in that time of persecution. Now, I can't say for sure that Roger did this, but I've read many biographies of those who went through this. And as they faced death, many of them said this, I am just thankful for the opportunity to serve my Lord in this way. Can you fathom that? I am just thankful for the opportunity to serve my Lord in this way. Thanks that God would consider them worthy of the sufferings of Jesus Christ in their death. Now, the Apostle Paul was often at that place in his own life. He, he leads off his final letter to the church in Corinth, 2 Corinthians with a discussion on suffering. And as he does that, I, I, he's focused on his own suffering, but I think we need to read this and we need to hear how Paul is actually thankful for his suffering. Thankful for his suffering because it is suffering in Christ. And as we hear that, I, I think we need to consider, are we thankful that we might suffer for Christ? Are we thankful that we might suffer for Christ? I'm going to ask if you're able. We stand once more in honor of God's word. I'll be in 2 Corinthians 1, starting at verse 3. And Paul, under the leading of the Holy Spirit, writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, 
so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Lord, there are, are many messages being thrown at us from the world right now. Uh, we just went through an election season. We know about messages. But Lord, we need to hear from you. And you have spoken in your word. So I pray that your spirit, who gave these words to Paul to write down, that your spirit who dwells within the saints, I pray that your spirit would make your word clear to us. But don't just write it on our head, Lord. Write it on our hearts. That we might believe, embrace, and be changed by it. Pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So right here, Paul describes suffering, suffering for Christ. And, he, and I'm not going to go through all of these verses, but, but I wanted you to hear all of them. But we're going to look at how Paul talks about suffering for Christ and how the, the suffering is something to thank God for if it is suffering for Christ. Why we should thank God if we suffer for Christ. Let's have a look. When we suffer for Christ, the first thing we see here is when we suffer for Christ, we should thank God because such suffering is suffering with Christ. I mean, that just sounds odd, but look what he says. Verse 5, For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in his comfort too. We share abundantly in Christ's sufferings. Or as the New King James puts it, the sufferings of Christ abound in us. Our suffering is Christ's suffering in us. I mean, that, that, that sounds like a strange phrase. We share in Christ's sufferings. And Paul doesn't break it down here, but he does break it down. If you just turn to the book of Colossians, just a few books over. And you look in Colossians chapter 1. Starting at verse 24, Paul writes, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. So he's talking about the same thing. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. So Paul says in Colossians that he's filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions as he makes the word of God fully known. Right? Filling up what's lacking in Christ's afflictions and make the word fully known. Now we know this. Christ suffered on the cross to, to die for sinners, to save sinners. We know that, that Christ's suffering, though, becomes effective in your life and in my life when we hear and believe the gospel, right? That's when what Christ did on the cross becomes effective for us. So to connect Christ's suffering to our salvation, somehow the word about Christ's suffering has got to get to us and we need to believe. And Paul says that he suffered, and we know he did, right? He suffered to get that word to them so that Christ's suffering would be effective for them. The word of God would be fully known by them, right? So what Paul is saying is, I am joining in the suffering work of Christ that he began on the cross. I am suffering with him so that you get that suffering of Christ's message and you are saved. Paul says, I am joining in the afflictions of Christ for you, is what he says. So we come back to 2 Corinthians. To 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says that we too have a share in the sufferings of Christ. And we find our comfort in Christ also because of the gospel. Because that's where we suffer for Christ, is in the work of the gospel. So when we suffer to get the gospel to others... 
we're actually joining in the suffering of Christ's work to save sinners. Now, we don't save anybody. Our suffering doesn't pay the price for anybody's sin. But our suffering is how we get the word of Christ's suffering to people so they can be saved. Jesus suffered to save. We suffer to get the message to lost people so they can believe and be saved. And we can all be comforted by the gospel. Now, how could you give thanks to God for that? Well, how could you not? That Christ decided that the way his suffering would take effect for people would be his people who already believe being willing to pay the price to get the gospel to other people. That's how he said, I'm going to let your suffering be tied to my suffering for you. How could we not thank God for that? We take part in the saving work of Christ as we suffer to get the gospel to a lost and dying world. This is our union with Christ. If we long to follow Christ, there should be joy in suffering for the sake of the gospel. Because it's when we suffer for the sake of the gospel that we are closest to Jesus who suffered for us. Think about this. If, if you go to the doctor, because you are really sick, and the doctor gives you bad tasting medicine, which when I was a kid, that's the only kind of medicine the doctor owned. Right? You were sick and he gave you a bad tasting medicine, and you take it home, and you take it, and you get well immediately. That does not make you like the taste of bad tasting medicine, right? It is still bad tasting medicine, but you're thankful for the bad tasting medicine that makes you well. You're quick to, to say, I will abide by the bad taste of the medicine. Well, when we suffer for Christ, we should thank God for the suffering. Not that we say, yea, suffering, right? Suffering in and of itself is called suffering. But we thank God for suffering that will bring lost people to Christ. Now, if you think that way, can you see how this should be a great motivation to be an evangelist, to get out there and tell people about Jesus? Because why don't we? Why don't we go out and tell people about Jesus? Because we're afraid we'll suffer. Whether it's rejection or, or something else, we're afraid we'll suffer so we don't take the gospel. But here Paul says, you should be thankful for the suffering involved if you're suffering for the gospel. So why would you be afraid of the suffering that comes with taking the gospel to lost people if that's something that in the end you're going to be thankful for? This attitude should make us go if we really believe what Paul says about the fact that suffering for the sake of the gospel is suffering with Jesus. is actually suffering with Jesus. Once you see suffering in the name of Jesus as something to give thanks for, it's no longer an excuse to not go share the gospel. When we suffer for Christ, we should thank God because that is suffering with Christ. Christ in gospel work. But we should also, when we suffer for Christ, give thanks to God because such suffering is suffering for others. It's suffering for others. If you look at verse 6, Paul tells the church, if we are afflicted, if we suffer, it is for your comfort and salvation. He said, I suffer with Christ, but I do it for you. I'm doing it for you so that you can be saved. I did it for you, Paul says, is why I suffered this. I was afflicted so that you could be comforted. Now, why were they comforted? They're comforted because they learned they don't have to go to hell for their sins. That's a comforting gospel we have. Right? Paul says, I brought you your comfort through my suffering. I did it for you. And, and when Christ brought me... Through that, when he brought me through that, and I found comfort in the fact that my, my suffering was suffering with him, 
It was so then I could bring it to you and you could find comfort in the gospel and you could go suffer with Christ and be comforted in the gospel. Because look what he says. If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Paul says, I suffered to bring you the gospel, which is comfort to you, so that you could go out and suffer and be comforted by bringing it to someone else in the gospel. Paul tells Timothy, I, I, in 2 Timothy 2.10, I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Paul says there's no suffering. I will not willingly suffer for the sake of God's people, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. I will suffer anything that they might be saved. Now, this may be easier to see than the first point of suffering with Christ because, I mean, Christ's suffering is Christ's suffering, right? But one reason why suffering for the gospel is good suffering is that the end result is people get saved. It's good suffering if some of them get saved when we go out and suffer to tell them about Jesus. Christ uses our suffering to bring others to faith, and then they join us in this suffering to bring others to faith. And they take comfort in the fact that we take comfort in that Jesus saves. That Jesus saves. In other words, the comfort of the gospel is our comfort in any kind of suffering. Jesus saves you really will be saved. Whatever the suffering, whatever the affliction, you will be saved. And we should be grateful to God that our suffering for the gospel is something he really uses to bring the comfort of the gospel to lost people. Suffering with Jesus is never wasted suffering. If you ever had to memorize verses, you might have had to memorize uh, something Isaiah wrote. Isaiah 52.7 he says, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of, of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And I never thought about this. It's, it's, it's how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet. You get the picture? Those are feet that are walking the mountains to save people with good news. When you suffer, the the the... the the, way, the hard way of the mountains to bring good news, you are beautiful feet people because this is good news that is good for people. When it leads the lost about a Christ as Lord and call him Savior, your feet are beautiful. And you should thank God for giving you beautiful feet that are willing to suffer to get the gospel to them. When we suffer for Christ, we should thank God because suffering is suffering for others. I mean, you can do a lot of good things for people, and praise God that you do, right? We pack shoeboxes to make little kids happy by giving them presents, right? I mean, that's why we put stuff in the boxes to make little kids happy. But we know that gift isn't the biggest deal we're giving them, right? Right? Because with this gift goes the gospel that may save them for all eternity. Right? I mean, we can do real good for people, eternal good for people, if we're willing to pay the price that it takes to get the gospel to them. And good news to give thanks for, God lets us be part of this. He lets us sacrifice a little bit of comfort in order that we might get the gospel to people and actually see them be saved. When we suffer for Christ, we should thank God because it helps others know Christ. Now, we all know the results may not be immediate, right? Well, welcome to part of the suffering. Right? That's part of it. When you go and you share Christ and you did your best job and you think, man, I nailed it that time, and they go, no, thanks, it's just not for me. Friends, that breaks your heart. That breaks your heart. That's part of the suffering. But what you do is you go out and you do it again, 
and you do it again and you do it again to that person, to other people, because you know one day God may use that to bring someone to faith in Christ. And that one was worth all the others. All the suffering of all the no's are worth it if one person believes and says, yes, I believe. Sinners actually get saved, and God lets us be part of that. Let's us suffer in order that they might be saved. So when we suffer for Christ, we should thank God because it's suffering with Christ and it's suffering for others. And we should thank God because it is faith-building suffering. This suffering is faith-building. Look at verse 8. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life and self. Even, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. That's bad. Paul, Paul says he wants them to know this wasn't some small suffering. This wasn't the inconvenience of he had to ride his bike because he couldn't take his chariot. It wasn't that kind of thing. Right? This, is, this was nearly cost me my life. I reached the place where I was in despair. I could see no way out of this alive. The sentence of death was upon me. Paul says, I felt like that convict on death row waiting for the warden to come escort me to the execution room. I felt the sentence of death on me. That is miserable suffering. This is suffering all the way to the edge of the cliff of potential suffering. You just don't go farther than this. But it was for Christ. It was with Christ. And it was for them. But it was painful and it was terrifying suffering. But then in the rest of verse 9, Paul describes the reason why this suffering was good suffering. Suffering to give thanks for. He says, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul says, you know what? This suffering was something to give thanks for because it was with Christ, because it was for you, but it was also something to give thanks for because it really helped me. It made me rely on the God who raises the dead instead of relying on myself. It built my faith. Friends, we won't get through the suffering that we would suffer for Christ on our own. We would despair. We would give up. But because the Spirit of God dwells within you as you suffer for Christ, instead of causing you to look downward and, and give up, what it does is it causes you to look upward and trust the God who raises the dead. If you despair to the point where you say the sentence of death is upon me, and you can say, but that doesn't matter because God raises the dead? That is faith-building suffering. That is faith-building suffering. In suffering, we are driven to the everlasting arms. And praise God for that. Thank God for that. Look at what he says in verse 10. I, I, I love Paul because he got, goes somewhere and you think he's done, and then he comes back because he says, he delivered us from such deadly peril. He says, we got out of it alive. And he will deliver us again. We're going right back into it. Right? He delivered me from the deadly peril, and I know he'll deliver me from the deadly peril again because that's where I'm going. Because it built my faith, trusting in the God who raises people from the dead the first time. So I'm diving right back in. And I'm just so thankful to God that he lets me do this. And he's the God who delivers us. Because one day, Paul knows, and one day it happened to Paul. It did cost him his life. But to Paul, that didn't matter. Because he's also the Paul who said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Because God raises the dead. Friends, I, I mean, I hope you understand that when you suffer for the sake of Christ and the gospel, it, it, it could be suffering so bad that it brings you to the point of despair where you find absolutely no hope except the hope that you have in Christ. That your salvation is not just some kind of feel-good thing that gets you through the day-to-day, -day, but that your salvation will ultimately result in your resurrection and your glorification and your eternity in the presence of Christ. 
That is the hope. When you've got no other hope, you've got the best hope there is. And so you give thanks to God for suffering because it turns your eyes to Jesus. It builds your faith. You suffer for the gospel because you live in a fallen world. This world is so darkly stained by sin that as you go out and you tell people about Jesus, it's going to hurt. You are swimming upstream. You're going against the flow. You're pushing against the grain. I don't even know what that one meant. But you're, you're doing something that's not natural in a fallen world, and it's going to hurt to go against it. The fallen world is an enemy of Christ. Christ says, they hated me, they're going to hate you. And you're only going to make it with faith in him. And you should thank God that that suffering drives you farther and farther into faith in him. Paul describes this, this relationship in a little more detail in Romans chapter 5. In Romans 5, 2, Paul says, Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Do you see that? Suffering to endurance, endurance to character, and character to hope, and this hope is sure because the Holy Spirit makes it so. You are not lacking. You think, I don't want to go into that suffering because I don't know if my faith is strong enough it, to get through that suffering. What Paul says is, brother, jump into the suffering. The suffering will make your faith strong enough because the Holy Spirit in you will turn it to hope. He will turn it to hope. Paul says, you want your faith built? Dive into the deep end. Go for it in the name of Jesus, and there will be hope. In the late 19th century, that great man of faith, Andrew Murray, observed, in the storm, the tree strikes deeper roots in the soil. In the hurricane, the inhabitants of the house abide within and rejoice in its shelter. So by suffering, the Father would lead us to enter more deeply into the love of Christ. This is especially true if we are suffering because we're claiming his name in a lost and dying world and going out and telling others that Jesus saves when they want to believe that everything else saves. We grow deeper into God. We grow deeper into our faith, deeper into his love, when we do what we are called to do and suffer in his name and for the sake of the gospel. And you know what? That should only make us thankful for the suffering. How could you not give thanks for something that increases your faith in a wonderful God? When we suffer for Christ, we should thank God because suffering is with Christ, because it's for others, and because it is faith building, and we should give thanks because suffering is prayer inspiring. It is prayer inspiring. You want to learn how to pray? Suffer for Jesus. Suffering with Jesus for the sake of salvation of the souls brought Paul to the place where his only hope was in Christ, but it didn't just work in him, it worked in the lives of the church at Corinth. Look at verse 11 says, you also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. And he's been describing the blessings. It's the suffering that drove him to faith in Christ. It's the suffering that brought sinners to salvation. That's the blessing. And he says, he wants lots of people to give thanks for that, so I want you to pray for me, is what he says. When the saints in Corinth learn the suffering of Paul for the sake of Jesus, Paul says, pray for us. I'm trusting in God alone. I want you to pray because then you will trust in him alone too. He says, I'm in it with God. You're in it with me. So let's go to God together. His suffering inspires their prayers. Paul says, I, I, again, I, I love 
I love Paul, but I'm, I'm almost terrified to imitate him. Because Paul says he's delivered me and I'm jumping back in and I know he'll deliver me again. And so Paul's talking about being delivered to the Corinthians and he says, but I'm jumping back in, so I want you to please pray for me. I'm going to be depending on God, so you depend on God too and pray for me. And Paul gives thanks for his suffering in a sense because he knows it's going to drive him and others to prayer. We know that we should pray for those who are going to hard places with the gospel, right? I mean, we get that. If you hear of a missionary who's going to one of those hard Muslim lands where they, they could be persecuted, even killed for sharing Jesus, you pray for them. I hope you do. I hope that's not really hard for you to understand why you should pray for them. But Paul sets an example of another truth here. It, because it gives him a surefire prayer request to send them, Paul is thankful for his suffering. I am thankful for my suffering because it gives me something I can ask you to pray for. That we can be in this together. When we suffer for Christ, we should thank God because that suffering is prayer inspiring. Now, I've not done this very often. I imagine you've not done this either. But we should thank God for our suffering when we can share it as prayer requests. Have you ever thanked God that you've got so much suffering you can ask people to pray for? I mean, I don't know that I've gone down that road very often. Well, I pray that you and I both get our eyes opened by what Paul's doing here. Because when we share that request, we're not just asking people to ask God to help us, we're asking them to join in the work, to suffer with us before the throne of God that people might hear the good news and God be glorified. Because it all depends on God. The work depends on God. If God doesn't go, it doesn't happen. If God is not with us, it doesn't happen. The work depends on God. The results of gospel witness depend on God. And the survival of the witness themselves depends on God. So when the saints go to God for this evangelist or for this missionary, they're joining in that mission. They're involving themselves in that mission. They're suffering with them. I mean, in a way, your prayers should feel that way. It shouldn't be easy. The prayers you pray for the suffering saints that are going to the hard places to share the gospel. You should, as Paul would say, agonize for them, is the word Paul says. When we suffer for Christ, we should thank God because such suffering is prayer inspiring. Another great 19th century preacher and a hymn writer, Horatius Bonner, he reminded his people of how they should receive prayer requests from their suffering brethren. He said, nothing so quickens prayer as trial. It sends us at once to our knees and shuts the door of our closet behind us. When we hear of the trials and the sufferings of the saints, it should be immediate and it should be that shut the door of the closet behind you thing. It, it, it should drive you to pour out your prayers before God before them. I don't know about you, but this, this passage really convicts me. It reminds me, first of all, we need to take the prayer requests that we receive from missionaries a little more seriously. If it can just be a list and we're just rattling off names, we're missing the point. We're to join in this with them before the throne of God. I might even suggest that since we know we have missionaries out there in hard places sharing Jesus... We need to be seeking out their prayer requests. We need to want to join them in this. Join them in mission through prayer. And, and they can be thankful for letting us do that. And, and I'm going to put her on the spot. If, if you want help finding missionaries to pray for, I know a lady who's really good at that. Debbie will help you get a good list of missionaries to pray for. I mean, she's good at that. Right? Because we need to be at this business really to the point where we feel we are joining them in their suffering for the gospel because our prayers are so hard for them. Suffering for Christ is something we should give thanks for when it comes our way because it is suffering with Christ. It is gospel suffering because it is suffering for others. It is how God has chosen to get the gospel to lost people. Because it is faith building. When we only have Christ to lean on, our faith grows. 
because it's prayer inspiring. We do it and we can ask others to join us in their prayers. And so I, I want to close by maybe going back to just a couple things we've already maybe talked about here this morning, but I think we just need to maybe bring home. First of all, I want to encourage you to consider the gospel once more as your only hope of heaven. I want you to consider exactly what the gospel really is to you. Maybe for the first time, maybe not again, but for the first time, but definitely if you have, I want you to consider it again, that, that you were lost in your trespasses and sins under the wrath of God, deserving eternal suffering for your sins, but because Christ died and took your place, paid the price for your sins, and because someone told you about the sufferings of Christ, risking the fact that, that it may not be well received, because someone told you and you heard and believed, you now do not suffer eternally. You have that freedom in Christ. You have been comforted in the gospel through suffering. Salvation only comes through suffering. You know that, right? You are not saved if Jesus doesn't suffer. You are not saved if someone doesn't take the risk of taking the gospel to you. Right? It, it just doesn't happen. And all this talk of suffering in order to proclaim the gospel, I, I think really demands again that, that we really take to heart the fact that, you know what? That's the only way I am saved. It's through the suffering of Christ and someone joining in that suffering and bringing me the good news that saves. And the second thing I would encourage you to consider getting out there and proclaiming the gospel. Getting out there and doing it. I mean, we're good Baptists. We talk about evangelism a lot. But I, I just want to encourage you, and I, I'm certainly convicted in this more myself too, that, that it's time to be willing to suffer to get the good news to lost and dying people. It, it's time to be willing to risk your family not liking you so much in order that they might hear the good news of Christ be comforted eternally and saved. It's time to risk the fact that your co-workers might think you're weird. Let me just tell you, if you're a Christian and you act at all like a Christian, they probably already do. So go ahead and share the gospel with them. It may be time for some of us to ask whether or not God is calling us to give up the life that we cherish right here and answer the call to go on the mission field and be that missionary going to the hard places. God doesn't just call missionaries to hard places out of other people's churches. Right? He might be calling someone out of this one right here. And you know what? If we believe what Paul just said, we pray that he is. We pray that he is. But whether it, 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 it's your own family, your co-workers, the people down the street, or are going out there on the mission field. I think as we look at this, if we are to be thankful for the suffering that comes as we are faithful to the gospel, if we're to be thankful for it, we ought to get busy at it. If Paul can say, God delivered me from suffering even to the point of death, praise God, let's jump in again, we ought to be willing to jump in the first time. So that's my prayer for us this morning, is that as we hear this, we quit letting the fear of suffering keep us from the joy that can be ours, even suffering for Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I, I am challenged, Lord. Um, your word is not always easy. And, and I fear this morning it is not always easy. This one may not be easy for us because we recognize that we have not obeyed. You called us to go wherever we go, be it here or to the ends of the world, 
and make followers of Jesus. You didn't call us to do it when it was easy or comfortable, but quite clearly, through what we've read this morning, you've called us to do it at what might be a great cost to us. God, give us hearts to obey. Forgive us for when we've let the fear of suffering keep us from going. Give us hearts to obey. And then, Lord, as the suffering comes, make us thankful. Increase our faith and make us thankful. God, I pray that as we go, as we strive to obey, that you might encourage us in this obedience by letting us see Men, women, boys, and girls come to faith in Christ. Your word promises that it does not go out in vain, and I pray that if we are faithful in this, that we would see the fruit of your word at work in lost and dying souls. Lord, I also pray this morning that if there is one, and there surely is, one here this morning, who has never recognized the wickedness of their sin, the surety of judgment, and turned to Christ for salvation, I pray that today, this morning, they would believe and be saved, that we might rejoice in that. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If Tom's going to come lead us in a closing hymn, and as he does, I would ask that you just consider how you need to deal with God's word, where you need to go, where you need to set aside the fear of suffering for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the lost one that you love, and make that commitment to God this morning. Just tell him, God, I recognize that I've had opportunities and I didn't go because I was afraid. God, forgive me. And God, give me the strength to go. I want to do it. Make that commitment this morning. Please stand.